Welcome to Perspectives El Paso. I'm Professor Leon Blevins, Professor of Government at El Paso Community College. I'm going to greet our special guest today, a landmark lady of El Paso named Diana Washington Valdez. I'm going to greet Miss Valdez, and then I want to tell you a little bit about her. Diana, good to have you on this show. Good to be here. Looking with you. forward to interviewing you, telling you a little bit. Now, I did something yesterday evening in getting ready for this conversation with you that I've not done with any of my guests over the last two years. I Googled you. I went on the internet and I typed in Diana Washington Valdez and it brought up basic information I'd heard about you before, about your writing with the newspaper, awards that you've won, uh, the book that you've written that has really uh, made the news, The Killing Fields, Harvest of Women, about the women being killed in Juarez over the years. And I've started reading this, but I've been busy on my own writing projects and haven't had time to finish it. So I, I, I guarantee you I'll finish it this summer. And uh, so we're going to talk about that. But when I Googled you last night, it brought up and told me things about you. And I was using my wife's computer, and I said, I'm going to Google you. So I Googled Shanna Blevins, and it brought up and said that she was Mrs. Claus, Mrs. Santa here in El Paso. And the article that that was in, you had written about the International Museum of Art and a Christmas program that we were doing there, Santa and Mrs. Claus. And uh, so I thought that was fascinating. I just Googled you, Googled her, and there you are with an article. So you write articles about all kinds of subjects for the That's El Paso right. Times. That's right. Uh -huh. <coughs> and uh, so welcome to the program. We want to talk a little bit. It's a conversation about your work. Uh, did you grow up in El Paso? Yes, I did. I went to grade school here, to high school, and to college. And uh, you even came to community college, right? That's right. And then to UTEP. That's correct. Okay. And uh, you really have set the bar. You've raised the bar. I've known a number of editors and a lot of writers for the newspapers when the Herald Post was here, for example. And you have really set the bar high for investigative journalism and have become internationally known, correct? You even get invitations from other countries to speak at seminars and things of this nature. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Uh, so we're very proud of you. And I also consider you a colleague because you teach part-time government classes at community college. And I've actually sat in your class and evaluated your teaching. And I want the public to know that I gave you a good grade in your teaching for the <laughs> well, class. Well, good. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> You're quite welcome. Now then, we want to talk about, we have a good side. We keep hearing that El Paso is one of the safest cities in the United States. We can have these wonderful Christmas parties and Easter programs and things and feel safe on this side of the border. Yet we hear on the other side of the border now that Juarez is the most dangerous city in the world. How did this come to be? Well, it did not happen overnight, that's for sure. Several of us who have worked at the El Paso Times and other colleagues of mine on the other side of the border have been watching the conditions develop that have led us to where we are today, and that is the, uh, the increasing strength of the drug cartels that operate in Mexico, and particularly the ones that operate on this border. Uh, kidnappings have gone on for quite a while, uh, execution-style murders, and uh, the disappearances of people in Juarez, including American citizens. We have been sounding this alarm for some time. And also mentioning uh, with that, that if something didn't change to reverse this course, that eventually uh, we would have a, a major problem. And in fact, that is part of what is happening in Mexico right now, is this explosion of um, uh, drug cartels, the violence, uh, the fight over the drug corridors, uh, the degree of corruption that has developed uh, throughout the years. For a long time, you've had corruption in the courts, in the police departments, uh, even in some of the political offices. Now, I noticed in your book, in the part that I've read up to this point, that it's very detailed and you have some very specific quotes. I was wondering, do you do all this yourself or do you have some researchers that assist you? No, I do my own research. I mean, part of why one does a book is to do, uh, to advance uh, an issue or a topic, and that entails doing original research. It means you go out and find out things that uh, aren't already published, aren't uh, necessarily already recorded. Uh, and the only way you do that is by seeking sources and new sources um, and throwing out, uh, as I do often, a wide net uh, to find out uh, what I wanted to find out. Now, we keep hearing on the news that when something happens, there's a shooting, sometimes multiple bullets that are, that are hitting these people, that it constantly they tell us that there are no suspects and no arrest. Why is this? Is that because of corruption in the system? If you're referring to the drug-related violence, 
there are two factors at play here. Uh, one, of course, is the corruption and the thorough corruption of the police force in, in Mexico. By that, I mean police force at all levels, uh, city, state, and federal. And I'm not necessarily the one who's saying that. We've had uh, witnesses who've testified in court cases here in El Paso to that effect. Uh, law enforcement officers in Mexico themselves, uh, politicians and others in Mexico themselves uh, giving um, testimony of the, of the situation. And the other thing that's happening is the apparent strategy that is at work right now uh, in the so-called drug wars of Mexico. Uh, these two things combined um, are contributing to the conditions that allow this wholesale violence to continue. Do you think that poverty has a lot to do with this? I, I know a, a man that was at one time a member of the Barrio Azteca gang, mm -hmm. and he recently told me that he believes a lot of it is just poverty. So many people are so poor that they're extorting money from people, they're kidnapping just to get money. So he doesn't believe that all of it is drug related. How do you feel about that? Well, I don't think that poverty necessarily leads to criminality, uh, but what we have are gangs that are taking advantage or exploiting poor people, knowing that uh, the economy is very bad right now. The recession has um, caused some maquiladores to close down, to lay off thousands of people. And uh, for a lot of people who are in Juarez, who worked in the maquiladores and suddenly find themselves unemployed, no jobs back home, no jobs here. Uh, young men, it's very easy to, to recruit young men into the drug trade or into other criminal activity, these, these kidnapping gangs, the extortion gangs, um, the robberies, uh, you name it. Within the last year, I've had three students who have been directly affected by what's happening in Juarez. One, her husband was shot and killed over there, left her with a two-year-old child. Another one, he saw uh, two people killed in front of his house. Uh, another one, uh, they were at a, uh, an exercise place, um, a physical fitness place, and uh, two gunmen came in and killed two people right beside her and her, her father. And so some of our students are being affected by this. Have you had any students been directly affected by the violence in Juarez? Have they told you about it? Yes, I have, and, and including colleagues at the, the newspaper. I mean, it's very difficult not to find someone in El Paso who's been affected by what's going on in Juarez because we have uh, so many family ties across the border right. on the part of so many people and people who work there, um, students who come to school here, and then we also have, of course, um, university, the university and, and other um, uh, educational institutions that have activities across the border. Uh, it, is, it is not hard to find someone who's been affected. Yes, my students and colleagues have been directly affected by uh, the violence there. Well, recently I heard a man on the news indicating he doesn't want us to call Juarez our sister city anymore because she's a bad sister. And I thought, even though we have a bad sister or a sister in trouble, we need to consider a sister. How do you feel about his kind of comment? Well, I think it's unwarranted because, frankly, the trouble is being caused by a small percentage of people. Right. Uh, the drug traffickers, the drug dealers at the very top, the corrupt politicians who consent these activities and uh, corrupt law enforcement who, instead of protecting the community, uh, find themselves on the payroll of the drug traffickers. Still, all in all, it's a small percentage. It's not everyone uh, that is corrupt. It's not everyone that is uh, involved in wrongdoing. And that's, it, but it's, it's kind of hard to lose that perspective sometimes when all you see are the headlines about somebody getting killed and you know somebody killed them uh, and that sort of thing. And this is just not Juarez. This now is uh, around Mexico, all over Mexico, that they're having these problems. And just recently, several journalists were kidnapped uh, uh, south of us toward McAllen, down in that area. And uh, your life is in danger, isn't it? Because you even write about these things? Well, anyone who writes about the drug cartels and corruption, and, and, I, and I'll say this, on either side of the border, always enters a zone of danger. And you have to be uh, aware of this before you go in and walk in there. You mentioned um, a journalist in another part of Texas. Well, just last week we had a, a NPR reporter, John Burnett, who was accompanied by a Canadian journalist, and they were held at a checkpoint in Valle de Juarez. And they spent some uh, very nervous moments there because they didn't know what was going to happen. That region has become incredibly dangerous for anyone. Uh, and you never know when a checkpoint is a legitimate one or it's one that the cartels are operating. And uh, they were able to 
after some phone calls were made to, to leave there unharmed. Well, this is uh, April of 2010, early April of 2010, and I saw you last week on NBC National News, and you were, as always, you were running from place to place trying to get <laughs> to the next stop. And uh, all that you had time to say to them was, when you enter war, is, it's like entering a war zone. Do you still go over there from time to time? No, I personally can't because of the threats against me, and, and I'm uh, too many people there know me. Uh, but uh, others, uh, journalists, for example, who are not from Juarez, uh, may go there once or twice, and they won't bother them because they know they're leaving. Uh, but the ones who live there, uh, it's uh, almost impossible for them to, to operate freely. Uh, and I, I tell people it's like having uh, Iraq next door or Afghanistan. Right. Really, it really right. is like that. Right. Just cross the border and it's That's a totally right. different world, right? <coughs> uh, let me ask you another one with regard to your sources of information. You told me recently in the hallway at school you're writing two other books, correct? That's correct. Are they on these kinds of subjects? Well, one of them deals specifically with the drug cartels <coughs> in Mexico. When I did um, the book on the women's murders, it had always been my intention to write about the drug cartels as well. And, and back then, I was uh, five, six years ago, I was trying to decide which one to do first, and I decided to do the women's murders because I felt there was a greater urgency there. But I had been all along uh, saving my notes and doing research with the idea that eventually I would write about the drug cartels as well. On the way over here <coughs> earlier this morning, uh, people were stopping me and saying, you're wearing a pink shirt and tie today. Is that for uh, Easter? I said, well, no, <laughs> not exactly. I'm wearing it in honor and memory of the women killed in Juarez. And Diana Washington Valdez wrote a book about that. And I said, I'm, many of us should grieve over what we're seeing. We, we do grieve, we cry, we pray about what we see happening to that city, to that, that nation. <clears throat> do you think Mexico's turning into a narco state such as happened to Colombia a number of years ago? I think Mexico became a narco state 20, 25 years ago. And what we're seeing now are, are the, uh, are those factors that make it more apparent, more obvious, including the, the, the drug violence, but it became a narco state 20, 25 years ago. Okay, now Colombia to some extent turned around to a degree because there was one time that their whole Supreme Court building was blown up and killed judges mm -hmm. and things like that. What do you think could be done to change it in, in Mexico? What can be done to change what's happening in Mexico? That's a very good question because what can be done depends on the leadership there and also the leadership in the United States and what that leadership is willing to do. Uh, a president in one term cannot do very much. And we're talking about uh, decades of, uh, uh, of things that have gone on that you can't suddenly just dismantle. Um, we, we don't see yet what has happened in Colombia. To me, that's one of the uh, proofs that we don't have a real war against the drug cartels in Mexico. If we did, we would be seeing judges, um, top law enforcement officials, politicians being murdered in relation to the drug trade because they've come against the drug trade. The other reason it's very difficult, uh, we have a recent expert, well, rather an expert recently uh, calculated <coughs> that Mexico's economy, 40% of it, relies on the drug trade. That's a tremendous percentage. So imagine pulling out 40% of a country's economy. Right. It's not going to happen. Right. Not now, anyway. Yeah, exactly. <coughs> uh, I think this is a, a great problem that is also part of the United States problem. The issue has been raised, I've raised it for many years, that we are letting a lot of guns go into Mexico, large production over here, and then them being smuggled into Mexico. So we become a part of the problem. Also, I've mentioned for years in my classes that we have such a drug culture in the United States that this is how they make a living. They make a living off of people in this country using their products. How, and Hillary Clinton recently, our Secretary of State, went to Mexico and ra was raising that issue. How do you respond to those issues? Well, I think there's an acknowledgement of these things, uh, and, and that's fine, but what are we doing about it? Yes, we have, again, it's a small percentage of people in the United States who are the drug consumers. They are the market. Right. They are the market. 
uh, in, in comparison to the rest of the population, it's a small group. But there, these people, especially the recreational drug users, are the ones that are feeling the drug trade. And not just in the United States, uh, Europe also, um, they're seeing drug use on the rise uh, dramatic, dramatic, the increase in the past, uh, over the past five years. And we've also seen the Mexican drug cartels start to take over the markets of Europe. They know where the money is and who has disposable income and uh, why, for the life of me, I can't understand why people with disposable income would uh, choose to use uh, their resources that way. Do you think we should legalize marijuana? I am not for legalizing any substances that are harmful to people's health, including marijuana. And I doubt that if, uh, as some uh, contend, that if marijuana is legalized, that that would end the problem. No, I think there would just be an adjustment within these, um, within the producers and the distributors. Uh, that's all. They would uh, be adjusting, but you would still see big fights over uh, the control of this industry, if you can call it that. Yeah, even if you legitimated it or legitimized it, they'd still be making money off of it and bringing products in or growing them in our national forest and things like that. And people would still be getting killed over it, yes. Okay. Now, notice uh, when I observe you in class or I'm walking down the hall and I see you teaching your class that you use the newspaper regularly. You require your students to subscribe to the paper or they have access to the paper on a daily basis? They have access to the paper on a daily basis <clears throat> thanks to community college making it available. And the uh, reason I require it is that many of them do not have um, a, have developed a habit of reading any newspaper on a regular basis. And, but the main reason I use it is so that they can see how relevant what we are studying in the class is, that every day there is something about uh, political science, about state and local government, about uh, the federal government, about uh, international politics. And when they start to see how, how government affects our lives every day, then they begin to understand that, that they're in a class not just because it's required, but because it really has a meaning and purpose. I should mention that just recently the school newspaper, the Hano Tribune, did an article about you. Instructor's dual role inspires students. Congratulations about the article being written about your work from that very aspect. In teaching your class, in the light of the kind of special investigative reporting you've been doing and even danger to your own life, in your classroom, what would you say to a student? The best thing about my job is this. And then what would you say the worst thing about my job is this? The best thing about my job is that it's always new. Every day there's something different. Uh, even if it's uh, an issue I've covered before, there's an opportunity to, to f discover, to explore a different angle. So nothing ever really gets old, even though you may be covering some of the same things over and over again. The worst thing, getting up in the morning. <laughs> what about deadlines? I thought you were going to tell me deadlines. Oh, no, I'm so deadline driven that um, it's just second nature to me. You know, and, and, and the sense of urgency that I've developed comes from uh, having deadlines built into my profession. Tell me about changes you've seen in the newspaper business in El Paso in the years you've been in it. The unfortunate uh, change all of us have experienced is the uh, lack of competition uh, due to the consolidation of the media. Uh, there are fewer newspapers across the nation. Uh, TV uh, news has undergone tremendous uh, changes. Uh, they say everything's going over to the internet, but it's not just that, is that um, and my main objection to what I think is a fairly new recent phenomenon is the direction um, of news toward entertainment, especially in TV. Everything's entertainment or something sensationalistic about the private life of some movie star. Or in this case, we have a golfer now who's, you know, whose personal life is being uh, spread abroad. Uh, to me, all of those things are a waste of time, a waste of resources. We're not, we're, when we invest a lot of time and effort in those areas, we're taking away from the information that people really need so they can make informed decisions. This is what I'm finding, uh, that uh, my students don't read newspapers, they don't watch news, television news, they're in social networking and listening to entertainment and music and things like that. I notice you've done a number of, of articles over the years of human interest stories, people that have overcome great adversity, for example, and things like that. Can you think back over your career? How many, how many years now have you been writing professionally uh, well, for I've, the newspaper? I've been in daily journalism for 25 years now. For 25 years? Yes. Okay. Do you think back, 
What did you write about that really made you proud of the work that you were doing? You thought, now this is something that really, I'm glad I did this article, I'm glad I did this story. Whether you won an award for it or not. Well, there are so many things that uh, I'm grateful that I've had the opportunity to write about. Uh, that, you know, it's very hard to just say there's one or a couple of things. Exactly. But one of the things that I do look for are people in the community that uh, have, as you mentioned, overcome adversity uh, to accomplish what they've been able to do because I think that those stories are important because they serve to inspire uh, the young people in particular. And for example, very recently I just did a story about uh, Davy Johnson. Who used to work here. Yes, yes. A, a nursing instructor, wow. uh, 80 years old. She lost her limbs. Um, and you know, I was very surprised when I f found out that right. that had happened. Uh, we used to call on her from time to time to interview her about various health matters, health issues in the news, that sort of thing. A very dynamic person with a very interesting history. Uh, her history of adversity goes all the way back to childhood and how she was able to overcome everything to be able to work in the profession that uh, she was passionate about. And that even after losing her limbs, she didn't stop. She kept looking at forward at what she could do after the amputations. I mean, to me, those stories are very important, just as important as uh, some of the investigative pieces I've done in the past uh, that I've won awards for. Right. Now, you have only so many column inches that you can fit in on this particular day, probably. Don't you have trouble leaving things out? Uh, sometimes, yes, but you do learn that uh, you can tell an effective story in a short space, and you just have to be uh, selective about um, what you put in the story. I've I can, you know, I've grown accustomed to what 16 column inches is, and I've grown accustomed to what a longer piece that's only 25 inches for some people, but is adequate, uh, can do. I had an editor one time uh, at the El Paso Times, I had uh, had written, there was a series we were working on, and she was the editor for it, and so I had written this 40 inch piece. Uh, I just felt everything had to be in there, and that's <laughs> as small as I could get right. it. And then she said to me, all right, Diane, I have to shred it now you write that same piece as if you only have 25 inches because that's what you're going to get for that piece. So I went to work, you know, whittling away and all of that, and she was correct. The 25 inches I wrote had more impact, was more effective than the 40 inches that tended to ramble on. Yes. So she from, had a lesson to teach you as an editor. Absolutely. <laughs> right, you want a good introduction. You want the body to say what you want it to say, and then you need a conclusion to get out of it. So, <laughs> what regards to how many inches Almost. that they're giving you? Uh, have you done any? Now, what, from time to time, don't you go on television and they'll interview about something? You're a companion uh, with the uh, a news station. Yes. Tell me about that. How do you feel about doing that? Well, we. This is also new for newspapers, like over the past uh, four to five years, uh, TV and newspapers began uh, to develop partnerships. So it's not all out competition like it's in the past. At the El Paso Times we have, uh, and they're contractual agreements with uh, KTSM currently, the okay. NBC affiliate, and with um, KINT, the Entravision affiliate in Spanish and English. And so part of the agreement involves uh, reporters doing promos of their stories on TV. Uh, and this is also good for the TV stations because sometimes they get to, in a way, indirectly report on a story that they didn't have or wanted to expand on that we have and then just tell other uh, viewers, read the rest of it in, in tomorrow's paper. And so that's where, at first it was very uncomfortable. You know, those of us who were trained to be print journalists, we did not train to be broadcast journalists. We did not plan to be before a camera and that's not what we wanted to do. Uh, but in time, everyone adapted, and uh, we don't think about it anymore. We just do it. Well, I find as a writer, sometimes it's rather lonely because you're working alone. You're, and you can got, kind of get isolated out there, and it's hard to get back in with the crowd and start interacting with them again because <laughs> you're so used to just sitting there focusing on it. Do you find that a problem? No, not at all. When you do these things uh, over and over again after so many years, you just don't even think about it anymore. There's a time when you need to focus on something, and you need to be working uh, with all the noise going on and uh, phones ringing and so forth. I mean, that kind of writing, what I do at the newspaper is not the kind of writing I do when I'm working on books at home, uh, when I do need to be alone and left alone so I can concentrate on longer pieces. And, uh, 
and, and analyze what I've written and that sort of thing. That's uh, it's a different process. Yes. Do you select your own topics when you start writing uh, t for the newspaper, or does an editor call you in and say, I would like for you to do something along this subject line? Both, both. Uh, all the reporters do both things. We have assignments that uh, we're asked to do, and we also propose stories. And uh, we, you know, if we go about it carefully and smartly, then uh, we'll get to do both things well. Do you have your students write articles or things for you, essays for you to, to, to grade? Sometimes I do. I try not to be um, hard on, on grading writings because it isn't uh, a writing class that I teach. So I try to get them to write in a way that does not, uh, where they're not self-conscious about the grammar. I just say, just write it. Don't worry about where everything fits, and uh, we'll worry about that later. Uh, what I want to see is your thoughts, your opinions, uh, not just uh, a regurgitation of what you read or what we discussed here in class. Right. Well, as I told you before we started this conversation uh, for this program, that I want it to be just a friendly conversation going on here about the work that you do and how you do your work. And I think that's been very helpful. And we're going to put this on a DVD so students at some point may be able to look at it and see how you do your work. And I do want you to know that those of us that work with you at Community College and you as a part-time instructor with us, we are definitely proud of you and the work that you do with the El Paso Times and the writing that you do. And I look forward to finishing your book. Our time is about gone here. We have just a couple of minutes. Any last words that you'd like to give to our audience here in El Paso? Well, I just want to let them know to continue watching this program because it's uh, very enriching. <laughs> oh, listen to that. She gives me a compliment. <laughs> I compliment you, you compliment me. I guess that's a fair trade then, and, and we're glad. So we want you not only to keep watching Perspectives El Paso, those of you that are tuned in today, we want you to keep, p keep picking up the newspaper, the El Paso Times, and read it. Now, we can also read it online, right? That's correct. Okay, so wherever you go, become an informed citizen, and let's continue to pray for and think about our sister city and our sister nation across the border. Thank you, Diana, for being with us today. Thank you for having me. It's a real me. pleasure to have you and to work with you. Tune okay. in for another program. We will try to have other interesting guests. I'm Leon Blevins.